everybody. You join me today for what I hope will be a brief but very interesting video. We are going to be getting a little bit philosophical. And as the backdrop for today's talk, we have this beautiful 1999 BMW E38 728i. It hasn't been too long since I last had an E38 Generation 7 Series on the channel. In fact, I drove in real time a 740i only a few days ago. And what's different between the two? Well, the obvious is the change of engine. The 40 had the later 4.4 litre BMW V8 in it, whereas this has the venerable 2.8 litre straight six, as found in pretty much the entire BMW lineup of the 1990s. Everything really from the Z3 to the 7 Series got a version of BM straight six. And if there's an engine BMW know how to build, it is this six. If you're looking for a dependable version of any Beamer, a six-cylinder is a good place to start. And for cars of this era, it may not have the most poke, in fact, about 190 horsepower here, but it is by far the easiest of the old sevens to keep running. Otherwise, it's more or less business as usual. Now, this car's been brought to me by channel fan and all-round good guy Mustafa. He bought this as a bit of a cheap runaround, replacing previously a Smart for two. I think we can all agree that his taste in cars is clearly improving. The crazy thing is that he bought this car for less than what I've just paid for the last round of fixes on my 7 Series. So I am only a small bit jealous. In fact, this car's nearly a spec twin to mine. It's in the exact same shade of blue as the 740i that I drove last week, Orient Blue Metallic. And the interior is in the same sort of combination of beige and chocolate as my own 7. The major difference being the fact that this has a black steering wheel. And I wish I had one of those, because chocolate steering wheel, I, I, just, I just can't do it. Sorry, I, I can't. You also have a very nice beige fabric headline in here, nowhere near as opulent as the 760. You've got sunroof, just as in the 740. This car's also a little bit more original, having the correct OE spec 16-inch wheels on it, and also retaining the factory fitment cassette. Oh yes, this car's still got a cassette in it. All round, though, it is a rather nice thing to do miles in. I would say that it does drive a little bit better than the 740, although that is marginal. If you're the sort of person that thinks luxury means a bling and chintz and features and stuff that rises out of the door cards and plays a tune to you, this is not the right car. But if you're the sort of person who believes that luxury is a nice old sofa that you recline into and could spend days in in total comfort, this is a very nice car. The materials quality may be in general a step down from the E65 generation, but the ride is absolutely sublime and it feels very much old school BMW. In fact, if you're a fan of the E36 or 46 generation 3 series or 39.5 series, a lot of this cabin is gonna feel reasonably familiar. But I did promise that we were going to have something of a philosophical conversation, and that we are. Because you see, I'm here to ask a question. What is the right car to be buying? And I don't mean which is the best car for you. I mean, what kind of cars should we now actually be choosing? I know it's somewhat unthinkable, perhaps even laughable to consider that somebody with two V12s on the driveway may actually give some thought to the future of our planet, but it is true. I do think an awful lot about what the future is going to hold for us petrol heady types and what the right direction to go is. I have had the pleasure of driving many electric cars and I've enjoyed quite a few of them. There are, however, many hurdles for the electric car to still overcome before I think it can really be accepted as transport for the masses. The first sticking point is price. A very, very cheap electric car is probably still going to cost you £10,000, and that's going to be something like a G-Wiz or a Twizy. And a Twizy doesn't come with doors as standard, so that's not really a car that you can consider. More realistically, for sort of £15,000, you could get yourself into something like a second-hand Kia Soul EV. And this video isn't the place for discussing the merits of battery life and so on and so forth. But that's a car which can seat four people, a little bit of luggage, however it has a range of around 100 miles. Fine perhaps if you're a city dweller, but if like me you actually do drive more than 100 miles in one sitting, it's just not right. Now more modern cars, like for example the Renault Zoe, the Nissan Leaf, 
Kia's e Nero, the new Soul EV, they're somewhat better. You can get over 200 miles to a tank. But even a reasonably humdrum one of those is still going to set you back about 30 grand. And that is a lot to be paying for a car which, on the face of it, doesn't really offer you anything more than you could get paying about 17 or 18,000 quid in a petrol or diesel vehicle. I know that diesel's reputation has really been irreparably damaged in the minds of many thanks to the goings on of the last decade, and I totally and completely understand that. Many people come to me looking for a car, and one of the caveats they'll bring is no diesels. This includes a lot of people for whom diesel would probably be the right choice. I read recently that apparently a modern diesel conforming to all current regulations is actually cleaner than a petrol car of only three years ago, to say nothing of one from about 20 years ago. So why then is it that I am about to propose a 21-year-old six-cylinder petrol car as a viable medium for saving the planet? Well, here is some of my reasoning, and I would invite everybody to join me in the comments for a bit of a lively debate. First off, to produce any new car is going to require a considerable amount of resources, both in time, materials, and therefore emissions produced. Now, I know that some work can be done to offset that, but by the same token, you could simply offset the fuel costs of running an older car. And here's the rub. Much of the maths about the savings, be it financial or environmental, of a new electric car are done on the basis of that car lasting hundreds of thousands of miles. And if everybody that you knew bought a car, kept it for 10, 15 years and did 200,000 miles in it before kindly scrapping it or selling it, I think electric cars would definitely be a very, very sensible thing for everyone to buy. But the car market has managed to get itself in this situation where everybody is buying things on PCP deals to try and keep the industry afloat. And those deals are coming with limited mileages. And that means that by the time the car is at 100,000 miles, it's more than likely on its third owner already. In fact, owners number one and two are probably going to amass maybe 40 to 50,000 miles between them, meaning that neither of those people have seen anywhere near the benefits that the car is supposed to be providing. I did try and source some figures for the CO2 involved in creating something like, say, a brand new Prius. As you might imagine, I didn't really have much luck finding those. If anybody does happen to know, I'd be really grateful to hear that, and if you could put that down in the comments below, that'd be awesome. Incidentally, a Prius is certainly nowhere near as majestic as this old 728. The funny thing is that CO2 is still the demon. It's still the one figure that all environmental authorities seem to be obsessing about. It's still in the UK the way that our vehicle tax, or vehicle excise duty as it's probably called, is calculated. This is the reason that you find VW, Audi and many others still making a huge number of diesels. Because they've been told, in no uncertain terms, if they don't get their CO2 numbers down below a certain level, they are going to be getting a very, very large fine. And that seems a touch unfair, really. It is the obsession with CO2 that in fact led us down the path of diesel in the very first place. It pains me to admit this, but I think the Americans probably got it right. They were always far more concerned with things like NOx levels, and that, as we've discovered, is the thing that's actually quite evil. That's the one that gives children cancer and so on and so forth. So I'm all for getting these old, horrible, nasty, polluting things off the road. 30-year-old diesels that chuck smoke out left, right and centre, yes, get rid of them. But newsflash, nobody actually wants to drive a 30-year-old diesel. They were horrible when they were new, and they're no better now. These lovely, silky smooth petrol engines, though, are a very, very different thing. They were, in reality, better for the environment then, and they're probably better for the environment now. And here is one of the other big pieces of information we need to consider. There are very many people for whom a car is something that they need to have, but they don't want to. They've got to own something because there is simply no alternative. There is no public transport where they live. A lot of those people might be tempted into getting something like, I don't know, an electric car, perhaps even a very small, economical new car. Surely the socially responsible thing to do would actually be to encourage people into old but decent cars just like this. I mean, this is exactly the sort of car to be getting me down a road like this. I'm doing 35 mile an hour right now. I am that bloke that I often find myself getting stuck behind when I'm trying to film reviews of sporty stuff. And 
I'm going to put my foot down just because you all want to know how quick the car is. Yeah, it's all right, but I mean, it was never going to be that fast weighing sort of 1.8 tonnes and having less than 200 horsepower. That's not the point of it. It's lovely, it's creamy, it's smooth, it's easy to drive, there's space for four people, room for luggage in the boot. This is a really decent proper car. And the cost of building it is something that was spent 21 years ago. I mean, do this for me. Go into Auto Trader or whatever and look up something humdrum, a Mondeo, a Clio, something like that. Look up a 10 year old example and see how many are still under 100,000 miles. It's gonna be loads of them. We've managed to convince ourselves in this country that any car with more than 100,000 miles on it must be utter and total garbage. We've become mileage obsessed. We've become a disposable nation. We constantly want to throw things away. And the fact is that old stuff very often can be quite good. I mean, I go on all the time about the combination of a torque converter and a big naturally aspirated engine being the best for driving around town. Now, in fuel economy terms, it's absolutely abysmal, it's atrocious, it's awful. Even in something like this, one of the more economical 7 Series you could have got, it's not going to be doing very good on fuel. But it's the response, it's how nice it is when you put your foot down. It will pull away from a junction instantly. There's no delay, there's no lag. If you want to get out in traffic, it will just do it. So many modern cars I drive, which in theory are far quicker than this, you know, super turbocharged, 400 horsepower, two cylinder things with dual clutch gearboxes, well, they're awful because they spend so long working out what gear they want to be in, they're getting the turbo up to speed. By the time you've actually started moving, the gap has gone. Car like this, no such worries. Put your foot down and you're off. This is to say nothing of features like auto start stop, which many people simply turn off or can cause all of its own problems. A car like this being much more mechanically simple than anything modern also is going to be a little bit easier to maintain. Now, I am not going to try and make the boldest claim, which would be that running an old 7 Series is the cheapest thing you could get for about a thousand pounds. This is the roads in the countryside, by the way, everybody. This is how farmers look after our roads. This is, this is what they do. They think this is a, an acceptable way to leave the streets. Hope they've been getting something really important out of those fields, and it's not worth too much money because they seem to have left half of it on the street. Now, were I driving down here in a 911 or something like this, I would be absolutely incandescent. I would be enraged. I would be fuming. But in the 7 Series, I just go, hmm, hmm, hmm. Yeah, less of this. Because that's what you do in a 7 Series. You, you relax. You, you chill out. It's something that's very hard to do in a modern car, especially a small modern car. Is this going to be as safe as a modern car? Well, no, it's not. It's still going to be reasonably safe, though, and I would say it's, again, going to be a little bit better than a car which is 10 years older still. You do have airbags everywhere. In fact, the E38 was the very first car in the world with curtain airbags. So it's actually pretty good on that front. And ultimately, if you are going to be the sort of person who's happy driving an older car, I think you're going to be more than aware of the risks. And if you are that sort of person who's only going to be doing a few thousand miles a year, well, your risk is that much lesser, isn't it? Or if you're the sort of person that drives in the city, the chance of having a high-speed accident is going to be, again, that much lesser. I think there's a little bit of irony to be had here as well, that here in the UK we had, a number of years ago, a scrappage scheme what the Americans called, more entertainingly, cash for clunkers. That was a great idea, I guess, a good way of giving the car industry a bit of a boost, and heaven knows it could really use a boost right now. The idea behind the scheme was fairly sound. You basically took any old car you'd owned for more than, I think it was a year or so, and you traded it in. You got £2,000 from the government, and I think you might have got a healthy deal from the dealership as well, depending on which car you were buying. And you got yourself into something new, so you got a better car, Dealers got a deal, manufacturers got a deal, everyone was happy. Except there was an awful lot of pretty decent, perhaps semi-classics, that were taken off the roads. I don't think people were rushing down to the local Vauxhall dealerships and swapping an E-Type for a Corsa, but there was a lot of stuff that these days probably would be worth a fair bit that unfortunately got destroyed, and the rules of the deal meant that you did have to destroy the car. That was simply how it worked. What unfortunately happened is that people got into the sort of car that we're now trying to demonise. Diesels from 10, 15 years ago, that was the sort of thing that people were buying. Cars we've since discovered weren't very good for the environment at all in their own way. 
And now comes my biggest gripe about the direction that government seem to be pushing us in. And believe me, it is a, a government push, and it seems to be one of all stick and no carrot at the moment. All of the things that I hear announced with regards to emissions or congestion or all that sort of stuff sound to me very much like a tax on the poor. You want to drive into the middle of London and you've got a 10-year-old car? Well, it sucks to be you. You're going to have to pay extra money. I once got charged £25 for taking my Saab diesel into London in the middle of the night. I went in at 10 o'clock at night and I left at 3 a.m. in the morning. I went to see Avengers Endgame awful film and I got charged 25 quid because I got two lots of the daily emissions charge that's just silly there was no other traffic there absolutely ridiculous and of course the people that have got new cars i.e. expensive cars well they're not going to pay that somebody that owns an Audi e-tron can drive happily into the congestion charging zone for free somebody that could only afford 2,000 quid of old BMW you're going to get done for it You want to live in Oxford or somewhere like that? Good luck to you, because we're increasingly moving towards the idea of cities where large parts of them are fenced off to anybody that can't own an electric car or at least a hybrid which can move itself under purely electric power. These are expensive things. This is to say nothing of the damage to driving excitement that's done by stuffing loads of unnecessary batteries and motors and everything else into a car. This is a car which has done 133,000 miles in its 21 years. It still feels very good. There's a couple of little creaks from some of the more cheap bits of plastic BMW put in here, but generally it's an extraordinarily nice thing to be in. And I can't really conceive of a world where as just a car, if you're treating a car as a white good, that you would need any more than this. All right, you know, put a USB stick thing in here so you can play more modern music, DAB radio or Android Auto, Apple CarPlay. Okay, what's that gonna cost you? A grand if you wanna spend some money on it? It's not going to be a lot. And most people, you know, old people in particular, are quite happy with FM radio. BBC Norfolk, that's all anybody ever wants, isn't it? Maybe Town 102 if you happen to live in Ipswich. Shout out to all the people that live in Ipswich there. I would really love somebody to jump into the comments, and hopefully by the time they've got to this stage in the video, they already will have done, and tell me if I'm just talking utter and total trash. Am I completely wrong? Am I utterly outdated? Am I that silly, silly man who thinks that electric cars are just the devil? Which, by the way, is not the case. I just think that we need a sort of more balanced solution to this problem. You know, it's like saying, oh, there's a bit of the house that needs sort of tending to, so just blowing the whole thing up. That That's... That's not the problem. You only need to put a new toilet in there. You didn't need to detonate the entire thing. There was nothing wrong with the kitchen, after all. That is the sort of approach that we seem to be taking. I'm also never very impressed when any sort of legislation comes from people who I'm not sure actually drive, or perhaps drive anywhere outside of London. And believe me, if somebody said to me that they were going to bring a law in that meant that anywhere inside the congestion charging zone you had to have an electric car, I think I actually could support that. I genuinely could but I would want to see help for those people that need to get into the zone and can't afford to do that, real help to get into an actual decent electric car, something that they want to drive. I don't want to see people getting done over for silly price electricity or stuff like that. It shouldn't cost you more to run an electric car than one of these. And believe me, there is no electric car, none, anywhere at the moment that you can buy and run for less than the price of a 1999 BMW 728i. Just isn't going to happen. Even if this car throws you a bill of a couple of thousand pounds a year, which if it's well looked after, it shouldn't. This car was actually featured in BMW magazine a few years ago, and it may be in cosmetically less than perfect condition, but you can tell that it has really been well looked after. In fact, it's only had about three owners from new. This is proof that cars can last. And that maybe is the big thing that we need to change. We need to move to a situation where people are interested in keeping cars for a long time. Because then improving them, improving the breed, improving emissions, improving all this stuff will actually have a real 
tangible impact. We've just got into this really weird situation where we require people with more money than sense to buy cars that they aren't actually going to see the benefit of in the hope that 10 years down the line, the people that can purchase them only second hand will be able to get them before they've actually been legislated out of existence. Because the automotive industry is doing what it can to try and help things, but I'm not entirely sure that government understands quite how long it takes to develop things. I mean, the EU and various other bodies just look at these things, I think, going, right, yes, this um, this CO2 number over here, yes, yes, it's, um, uh, next year, 20% lower. Ah, done. And all these car makers are going to be sat there going, oh, what, 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 Re really? Like, how? Tell us. What do, you, what do you think they are, engineers or magicians? You know? I mean, only last week I was at Audi's Quidditch tournament. I mean, the, the, you have to be realistic about these things, you know? And it pains me to say that there are two cars I've probably driven in the last month that actually make sense. One of them was an electric car. It was a Renault Zoe. And it made sense because the man who owned it does 30,000 miles a year. And he also owns a V8 Range Rover. And in that situation, the Zoe is the perfect car for him. The other one really is this, because for the sum that Mustafa paid, I cannot imagine really a comfier or better way of getting from A to B. This is an absolutely a glorious car. And trust me, there's lots and lots and lots of things that I prefer about newer cars. You know, I love having Android Auto. It's great. It's wonderful. It's brilliant. You know, I like sat-nav. Not so keen on cars that try and, you know, push you into the hedge because they think you're about to cross the white line that's less fun and there are a few different things that I'm not convinced we've done that are good ideas as you can probably tell from the general theme of the video the fact that a car now cannot get a maximum crash safety legislation without a whole host of electronic aid seems a little bit odd but I just think that perhaps what we need to do is just take a step back, look at the direction it is that we're actually going in and work out whether we really are headed the right way or if we're just making an awful lot of noise and bluster and actually pretending that we're doing the right thing. Are we simply virtue signaling on a pretty much national or even global scale? Because from where I'm sat, and it's a very comfortable seat, I have to say, with some electric adjustment and everything else, I'm just not sure we're really doing the right thing. Anyway, that's enough from me today. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I want to thank Mustafa for bringing his 728i down and giving me some lovely food for thought. Don't forget to like, comment below, subscribe if you haven't already, and we shall see you all for the next one. Bye-bye.